Good morning. Thank you for coming this morning. Uh, this is the last full day of our Ango that started on December 26th. Uh, our annual uh, deep practice within the city, within the context of just our ordinary lives. Um, so we've all engaged in kind of a more, more serious practice, coming here more often. And, uh, you know, uh, this, uh, f this flu that's come up, the coronavirus or COVID-19, uh, really has kept away, like today and probably tomorrow, quite a few Sangha members who very, very intelligently are recusing themselves uh, because they might be at risk or might risk us. So it's going to be a little smaller than it usually is every year. Uh, and that, Joran, uh, as our shoe so, you just have to, you know, this was the way it was <laughs> in 2020. <laughs> Uh, so Joran has been leading us from, from uh, the beginning, you know, and did all the kind of setup for our, our year-end retreat that we did. And she's been working with the Zazen Kais, uh, all the registration and so forth. And, and then this wonderful urban session we just had from Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Uh, and because she's an artist, you know, we did a, we did a lot of work, creative work. And it was uh, we worked with the body on Wednesday. We worked with collecting sounds, sound recordings outside, and coming back and learning to edit them, uh, making our own little mixtapes. Uh, and uh, yesterday, collage, uh, visual work, uh, and at the very end of the day, uh, some young people came, and that was that was exciting. So. It was really a wonderful, I appreciate it so much, uh, Joran. Um, you know, uh, I think that that is one of the most important aspects of our Zen practice, of our kind of contemporary 2020 New York City Zen, is taking care of Sangha in different kinds of ways and, uh, and relating to us in, in the ways that that are important to us, and we have social justice is a huge issue here, uh, very important, uh, and the arts, because we have so many artists, and, uh, and those of us who love the arts, and who are drawn to that. So those are, those are two things that are very powerful for us here at, in our group. Uh, uh, the thing is, uh, years ago we made a decision uh, to keep the doors open, because we're so well located here, uh, to keep the doors open three times a day. Uh, and so we have kind of like morning sanghas, all week long, every morning, 7.30, we're here. We have noontime sanghas, little, little groups of people that come. If you're ever here at 12.30 to 1.30, you meet a whole different cohort. And then in the evenings, you know, there's the Monday people and the Tuesday people, etc., and the Sunday people. Uh, and this is, this is what I think is a, is a really important aspect of our practice. And the downside of that is we don't know one another. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, sometimes if I'm here at noon, I meet people that have been coming for years, and I don't know them. So you may not know Joran Marshuso. I'm going to tell you a little bit about her. Um, she is one of the founding members of the village Zendo. She received Jukai in the very first cohort that we had in January 1997. Huh? So we could say Joran's an old timer. <laughs> uh, and at that time, uh, she received the Dharma name Jorin, Contemplative Lotus. So you get contemplative, you know, a thoughtful, uh, aware observant, but lotus, the wren, hmm? the lotus kind of lives in the mud of life, in the reality of the moment. And somehow the lotus is like nourished by that mud and blossoms into a beautiful 
and in Zen or in Buddhism in general, it's considered a very pure flower. It represents for us the possibility that no matter what's going on in our lives and no matter what we're subjected to, in the reality of the moment, we're able to take that as nutrient and turn it into a beautiful quality. So that's, that's our Jorin. Uh, I want to recall an incident from many years ago, uh, well, probably even before 97, probably it was in the early 90s. Uh, I was still teaching at NYU, I was teaching a new media seminar, and Joran was a student of mine. Uh, uh, and the class was in, in uh, creating art out of the new digital technologies that were around. And uh, mostly uh, during the presentations, there were these kind of really interesting, curious hacks that people had done with the different, different technologies. Uh, and then I just, I cannot, I haven't forgotten after all these years, Joran's piece. It's still in my mind. Uh, it was profoundly moving. Uh, and it was about loss and memory. Uh, it was it was a heartbreaking piece, and that's kind of unusual in a you know in a seminar where people are showing what the texts can do. There's this fabulous piece that was just presented to all of us. Uh, so it, it went beyond the technical and the fashionable, uh, and explored you know kind of the deep, complex reality of our lives. That was a long time ago, and so wonderful to have you here as our as our Shuso and turn and becoming a senior student and expected to give lots of talks <laughs> and continue to support us. Um, she is uh, she teaches at Temple and is the director of performing and cinematic arts there. Uh, so the lotus is continuing to blossom. And you may know that on a personal level, Joran and her wife, Deborah Sherman, uh, who also pre presented a, a body work here, uh, who is a therapist and movement specialist, the two of them adopted uh, a son, Solomon, at birth 12 years ago. I couldn't believe it. You know, I've seen him through the years, but I saw him yesterday. Oh, he's grown into the most beautiful young man. Oh, heartbreaking. Lovely. So, parenting is an exercise, I'm sure you know. Uh, again, the lotus unfolding over and over again. Teenage years, another lotus. <laughs> so, I just wanted to introduce you, Joran, to the community. And, and during this period, uh, we've been, uh, during this ongo, we've been studying uh, the text Zen Echoes. Uh, it's a collection of koan verses uh, by three medieval Chinese women, uh, Zen masters. Three Chinese women, Zen masters, or Zen masters. Uh, so it seemed appropriate to me that that is uh, the text that we studied during uh, Joran's Ango. So we all know that you can't pick up any of the any of the newspapers or books uh, these days that we're uh, not becoming more and more aware of the erasure of women and people of color and those of sexual and gender roles. We see it in everything that we look at. Uh, and it's about how we've told the stories in art, in science, history, politics. How, how we told the story, we, we erased so many people. Uh, so, you know, almost every week we find a new master arriving uh, from some different uh, discipline. 
But it's not just those who were ignored that who suffer. All of us suffer from that. When we don't see the wholeness of life. Uh, there's so many different ways to understand reality. And we're just becoming aware of that. So, for example, last week a friend of mine uh, gave me a uh, copy of the preface to a new book about George Washington. The name of the book is, You Never Forget Your First. <laughs> and it was written by Alexis Coe. And what struck me in this preface that she wrote was the point that she made that almost all the biographies of Washington were written by men. There's only one that is, you know, the historians consider it all serious. It was not written by a man. And uh, she contends uh, that they not only were they written by men, but they're written for men. Uh, and she goes out, uh, you know, con to point out in these different texts the consistency vocation of this quality of manliness uh, and uh, adjectives, uh, which are part of the classical archetypal image of men, the male narrative. For example, they're always saying he was a large man. But a lot of people are obsessed with how strong his thighs were. <laughs> Decisive. She asked, what George Washington would emerge were we to learn from him to, from women instead? For example, it's rarely mentioned that he was sterile, that he was raised by a single mother, that he deferred to his wife Martha for all the major decisions, such as uh, freeing the slaves, and had her do that. Who knows what other dimensions we might miss. And we might appreciate him in a very different way, as a sensitive man, as a man that embodied not only the male, but also the female principles. Oh, interesting. So we've heard this before in the Zen texts also. And when I read that, and the reason I'm sharing it with you is I realized um, how my studies of Zen have, co have come down to me uh, from the male perspective. I mean, all the translators are men. Uh, so it, and my teachers were all men. So there's a kind of like, there's a perspective there that, I, that was kind of invisible to me uh, and that is now being righted by some of these uh, new books that are coming out. Uh, there are very few women translators around. Uh, but the book that we're studying this time, uh, during this Ango period, uh, in honor of Joran, the book Zen Echoes, is, is written by a woman uh, uh, scholar, uh, Chinese scholar, um, I mean, she's an American scholar, Beata Grant, uh, of Chinese uh, Zen history. And uh, so this book helps us to shift our understanding a little bit, kind of widen it, make it more uh, just open and free. Uh, so I have selected the uh, Ur Koan uh, Mu. Uh, for us to look at today. And uh, so their commentaries are all verse commentaries uh, on the koan mu. Um, and you may know this koan. It's the first one most of us study. It's number number 18 in the Book of Serenity. It's number one in the Mumankan. Uh, if you recall, the question is, a monk asks Joshu. So Joshu's a great teacher and uh, the monk comes to him and asks, has a dog the Buddha nature or not? Joshu says, Mu. Tip, mu uh, typically means no or you know, does not have. No. But of course, fundamental Zen teaching is that all beings have Buddha nature. All beings can wake up and see their interrelationships with all. 
and all beings can express their wisdom and compassion. Why, why does Joshu say no does not have? Hmm? So, you know, we use this koan as our first kind of breakthrough koan because uh, it's short and confusing. <laughs> confusing uh, to our ordinary mind that wants to separate and isolate. The koan is challenging us to include everything. And our mind wants to exclude and shut out. You know, possibly uh, those of us who know, who are terrified of the news with the corona, with the COVID-19, uh, could realize that, you know, it's a profound teaching of the interrelationship. <laughs> There's this, uh, this thing that connects all of us, right? It's invisible, uh, except to the, uh, what, microbiologists. Uh, and yet it's something that reminds us that we're all connected, whether we want to be or not. So Mumon writes a verse to this koan. Uh, the dog, the Buddha nature, the truth is manifested in full. A moment of yes and no. Your body is manifested in full. How is your body manifested fully when we're experiencing yes and no? That's the question that Mumon poses. Zen master Miaozong uh, was a 12th century Zen master, uh, a woman uh, that established, uh, she had been a noble woman, her husband died, and so she established a convent, and she became a great uh, Zen master, perhaps one of the greatest. She wrote, the iron-walled silver mountain was pierced by a single arrow. That screwed up Joshu. When he speaks, he just causes trouble. So, the Iron Wall, Silver Mountain, what is that? It's a, to me, it's a really brilliant image of our idea of Buddha nature. Right? Our notions about what it is, this interconnected wholeness, this interrelated universe. It's not the interrelated universe, it's our idea about the interrelated universe. The iron walled silver mountain. It becomes like, in our minds, like silver. Shiny, hard, walled by iron. A mountain that's completely impenetrable, impenetrable in our mind's eye. And then she pierces it by a single arrow. What is that piercing? Isn't it Joshu saying, Mu, no, does not have. Don't get caught. If not Buddha nature, what then? That screwed up Joshu. <laughs> when he speaks, he just causes trouble. Yeah, she's telling us when we try to separate anything from the whole, we screw up, we cause trouble. It's a lot of trouble. I encourage you to screw up. 
along with Miao Zong. And stir up that one dimensional thinking, the absolute and the relative. Is it not two? It's only our mind that makes two. And our minds are great. We love, you know, they do wonderful things. They care for the universe. They care for one another. And yet, we get caught in that, this and that. And that's what Miao Zong is saying. And that's why she's, you know, uh, that screwed up Joshu. When he speaks, he just causes trouble. Well, thank God for Joshu causing that trouble. Or thank Buddha, I guess I should say. Uh, a couple of generations later, uh, Zen master Bauchi wrote about this koan. Uh, her response was, the vastness of karmic consciousness is hard to prove. But when Mr. Zhang drinks wine, Mr. Li gets drunk. <laughs> Lying in the street, sleeping in the alley, blocking people's way, do you dare say the domestic animal is really so bad and lazy? It's so earthy. We were talking about the oneness. And she talks about dogs. Lying in the street, sleeping in the alley, Reminds me of our homeless friends around here on Broadway. My way home from the Zendu in the morning, I go by this uh, one group of people that sleep under one of the overhangs. You know, they even have a mattress now, three of them, <laughs> all cuddled up. lying in the street, sleeping in the alley. Maybe it's my mind sometimes lying in the street, sleeping in the alley. Maybe sometimes it's just me blocking people's way. So I, I think Bauchi is reminding us not to separate to realize the intimacy, and she's, she's evoking this funkiness of life. She's reminding us that we're all in this together. When Mr. Zhang drinks wine, then Mr. Li gets drunk. And we could say right now, since we're all so concerned about the sharing of this virus, we see that when you know, someone sneezes, <laughs> someone else might get sick. Hmm? When Mr. Zhang drinks wine, then Mr. Li gets drunk. I think it's also an important teaching for us at this time politically, uh, when it's so easy to other so easy to create another, to dehumanize, to separate. She's reminding us, with her Mr. Zhang drinks wine and Mr. Li gets drunk, that we're all cut from the same cloth. So Master Bauchi, you know, uh, had a, a close friend, a Dharma sister, uh, Zuiki, who was head of a, a convent uh, and was also a renowned Zen master. So the two of them were Zen masters at the same time in the same province. Excuse me. Uh, Zuiki wrote, Zhou Shu and his dog if it bites you, you will die. But if it possesses Buddha nature, the poison shouldn't go that far. <laughs> Joshu and his dog, if it bites you, you will die. But if it possesses Buddha nature, the poison shouldn't go that far. 
So let's just think for a minute. What does she mean? If it bites you, you will die. She implying that if the question digs deeply enough into you, you will allow it to help you drop away that superficial notion of your separateness, your theoretical mind, and allow you to sink deeply into the true quality of Buddha nature, Buddha nature consciousness. You will die from the dog bite question. So the small self drops away and an awareness arises. And the awareness is not something that can be articulated in words, which is, you know, why we love koans, because it really can't be articulated in words. And yet there is an awareness that arises, and I see it in Dharma students who practice diligently, continue to practice. I mean, you know, the change is, is just beautiful to see. Can it be articulated? Not really. This incredible transformation that arises. When we begin to realize outside of our normal cognitive patterns, we begin to realize our, our relationship to the wholeness. To these old women from a long time ago and the old men that taught them. That bite you, you will die. If you get it, you'll be free, is what she's saying. In the next couplet, though, uh, she turns it upside down. But if it possesses Buddha nature, the poison shouldn't go that far. That's curious, isn't it? On the other hand, <laughs> Even if the dog bites you and you recognize your Buddha nature, well, being Buddha nature won't last. You won't go that far. Because in the next moment you are also your selfish little sentient being. <laughs> Separate and prone to the three poisons. I won't accuse you of it, but I certainly know it's true of me. <laughs> I love this realistic, this canny last line. It won't let us, it, it's not giving us a, some sort of uh, cure-all for life. And it is, in fact, when you think about it, This sentient being quality is what gives us the space to actualize our Buddha nature. It's that same but different quality that allows us to love, to set proper boundaries so that we can protect ourselves to make decisions, hard decisions, for the earth, for the homeless, for the suffering. One of our members wh whom I really rely on here uh, for this session uh, sent an email. She has a cold. She has a major role here in all of the things that we're doing. And we had to say, no, stay home. Maybe she, does, she doesn't have the flu, but being here and throwing, and, and she will just upset all of us so much <laughs> with the snot and everything, you know. So just stay home. That sentient being quality. We can call it that protective thing, you know, but actually it protects all beings. And it leads into our Buddha nature. 
We've had a, a subtle and wonderful week of practice here. Thank you so much, Joran. Uh, this afternoon, uh, in the late afternoon, we'll have a, a traditional shuso tea. It's called Hansako Gyocha. Um, and at that time, I will ritually give uh, Joran her, her koan to defend tomorrow, to speak on and defend uh, for her dharma dialogue or dharma combat uh, in our community celebration tomorrow for Shusahasan. So if you're not familiar with it, our dharma combat is what we inherit, the translation we inherited, although some prefer dialogue. Uh, it is a, a ceremony in which tomorrow uh, Joran will give her first Dharma talk on a koan, and uh, then uh, the community will be uh, invited to ask her questions, to challenge her, or to find what, how she understands uh, this koan. And so we do that in a kind of ritual way. We, have a, 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 we put a list in the back of the room, and you can sign up, I'll be the second person, or I'll be the fifth person, or I'll be the first person to ask a question. And, um, and then we'll just go down one person after another. And it's always a lot of fun. It's a wonderful uh, expression of the Dharma, and it's also a, an expression of the community coming forward and supporting uh, our shoe So I encourage you to sign up. We'll put the sign-up sheet up when shall we do that. After the practice ends today, it'll be on the on the table there, and uh, please sign up for it. Uh, it'll be great. Uh, so I'm to end this talk with a little gatha I wrote for it. We're always looking for a response, a correct answer, but really, what could be said about any of it? And yet we keep bringing water to the well, filling ourselves with the joy of seeking. Mm -hmm.